Greetings. Welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, and things adjacent. Please remember to like this video. Please remember to make sure that you are still subscribed. And into this story. Uh, this is from theconversation.com. Uh, global emissions to hit 36.8 billion tons, beating last year's record high. So that would make this year a record high. Um, again, we are increasing emissions. We are going in the opposite direction of where we want to go. Global emissions for 2019 are predicted to hit 36.8 billion tons of carbon dioxide, setting yet another all-time record. This disturbing result means emissions have grown by 62% since international climate negotiations began in 1990 to address the problem. So 30 years, 30 years of international climate negotiations have yielded a 62% increase in emissions. The figures are contained in the Global Carbon Project, which today released its 14th Global Carbon Budget. Digging into the numbers, however, reveals a silver lining. While overall carbon emissions continue to rise, the rate of growth is about two-thirds lower than in previous years. <clears throat> Driving this slower growth is an extraordinary decline in coal emissions, particularly in the United States and Europe, and growth in renewable energy globally. A uh, less positive component of this emission slowdown, however, is that a lower global economic growth is that a lower global economic growth has contributed to it. <laughs> okay, so um, we're getting less coal emissions. Overall, car, uh, the rate of growth is lower. But that's because of an economic slowdown. Most concerning yet is the very robust and stable upward trends in emissions from oil and natural gas. Uh, coal is king, but losing steam. The burning of coal continues to dominate CO2 emissions and was responsible for 40% of all fossil fuel emissions in 2018. That's quite a bit. Followed by oil, 34%, natural gas, 20%. However, coal emissions reached their highest levels in 2012 and have remained slightly lower since then. Emissions have been declining at an annual uh, emissions have been declining at an annual average rate of 0.5% over the past five years of 2018. I guess that's good. In 2019, we project a further decline in global coal CO2 emissions of around 0.9%. That's positive. Uh, this decline is due to large falls of 10% in both the U.S. and European Union and weak growth in China and India. The U.S. has announced the closure of more than 500 coal-fired power plants over the past decade, while the U.K.'s electricity sector has gone from 40% coal-based power in 2012 to 5% in 2018. That's quite a reduction. Whether coal emissions reached a true peak in 2012 or will creep back up will depend largely on the trajectory of coal use in China and India. Despite this uncertainty, the strong upward trend from the past has been broken and is unlikely to return. Oil and natural gas grow unabated. CO2 emissions from oil and natural gas in particular have grown robustly for decades and show no signs of slowing down. In fact, while emissions growth from oil has been fairly steady over the past decade at 1.4% a year, emissions from natural gas have grown almost twice as fast at 2.4% a year and are estimated to further accelerate to 2.6% in 2019. Natural gas is the single largest contributor to this year's increase in global CO2 emissions. Huzzah. Oh, natural gas, the clean energy. <clears throat> this uptick in natural gas consumption is driven by a range of factors. New unconventional methods, quote unquote, of extracting natural gas in the U.S. have increased production. This boom is in part replacing coal for electricity generation. In Japan, natural gas is filling the void left by nuclear power after the Fukushima disaster. In most of the rest of the world, new natural gas capacity is primarily filling new energy demand. Oil emissions, on the other hand, are largely being driven by the rapidly growing transport sector. This is increasing across land, sea, and air, but is dominated by road transport. Oh, 
Australia's emissions have also been significant, has seen significant reductions from coal sources over the past few decades, while emissions from oil and natural gas have grown rapidly and are driving the country's overall growth in fossil CO2 emissions, emissions from deforestation. Preliminary estimates from 2019 show that global emissions from deforestation, fires, and other land use changes reached 6 billion tons of CO2, about 0.8 billion tons above 2018 levels. The additional emissions largely come from elevated fire and deforestation activity in the Amazon and Southeast Asia. The accelerated loss of forests in 2019 not only leads to higher emissions, but reduces the capacity of vegetation to act as a sink, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. This is deeply concerning, as the world's oceans and plants absorb about half of all CO2 emissions from human activities. They are one of our most effective buffers against even higher CO2 concentrations in, in the atmosphere and must be safeguarded. It doesn't seem like that's happening. It seems like it's going in, that is going in the opposite direction. Not all sinks, hashtag not all sinks, can be managed by people, the open ocean sink being an example but land-based sinks can be actively protected by preventing deforestation and degradation and further enhanced by ecosystem restoration, restoration excuse me, and reforestation. These are, these are key right here. Ecosystem restoration and reforestation. Key. And preventing deforestation and degradation. Key. For every year in which global emissions grow, the goals of the Paris Agreement are one step further removed from being achievable. achievable. They drift off into the distance. We know many ways to decarbonize economies that are good for people and environment. Some countries are showing it is possible. It is time for the rest of the world to join them. Moving on, uh, let's see. Let's just go through this article. Um, I don't know how long it is. I don't know how much time I'm going to spend on it. Maybe I don't need to spend too much time. Four ways the climate crisis could trigger a 2008-style economic crash. Hurricanes, fires, floods, and sudden decline in oil demand could all have serious consequences. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is from December 3rd, 2019. Any day now, a catastrophic event caused by climate change could detonate a financial bomb that incinerates powerful companies, sends fireballs through our financial system, blasts the U.S. economy, and devastates millions of Americans. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment, warns a new paper from the left-leaning Center for American Progress. It's time for regulators to take decisive steps to ensure that the financial system can withstand climate-related shocks. How are you going to do that? <laughs> Instead, uh, regulators are going to do that. I, I don't know. Instead, Wall Street's six largest banks are pumping money into fossil fuel investments and increase those risks. The over $700 billion those banks committed in financing to companies like ExxonMobil, Chevron, and BP from 2016 to 2018 is helping make possible Canadian tar sands expansion drilling for Arctic oil and gas, fracking in West Texas, and other activities that drastically reduce our odds of being able to stabilize global temperature rise at the relatively stable threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. There is a degree to which some of these banks are looking around and thinking, okay, where, where are we going here and what are the risks, said Graham Steele, a director at Stanford Graduate School of Business. But in the meantime, they're going to keep trying to make as much money as they can. Steele, who co-wrote the paper with CAP policy anal uh, analyst Greg Gelzinis, explained that Wall Street's denial of climate dangers is setting up us up for a 2008-style financial explosion where risk spreads in a way that cannot be contained or isolated. Here are some of the ways that he can see this bomb being set off. Let's check them out. Number one, a devastating Florida hurricane bankrupts a major insurer. The world was shocked when Hurricane Andrew slammed into South Florida in 1992, causing $15.5 billion in damage and bankrupting at least 16 insurance companies. Uh, but that could be quaint compared to what the physical and financial risks of a disaster are today due to climate change. Modelers with the Center for Risk Studies at Cambridge's University... Cambridge University's Judge 
Business School estimated that a Category 4 hurricane that made landfall south of Miami ripped into Tampa and then made a landfall again near Pensacola could cause $1.35 trillion in damage, as Vice reported earlier this year. That level of financial destruction could easily bankrupt a major insurance company. Stress could be transmitted to banks and other non-bank financial companies that serve as creditors or counterparties to the failing insurance company. The cap paper reads, in the Cambridge scenario, spiraling financial distress puts $2.35 trillion of global GDP at risk. This will be doubly catastrophic for millions of ordinary people in the disaster zone. You're going to have the irreparable damage that's caused by the climate. And on top of that, you'll have these financial institutions that aren't going to be, be able to provide the basic services to keep businesses, households, and the rest of us going, Steele said. Two. Insurers flee California wildfire zones and mortgages crater. Munich Re, earlier this year, drew an explicit connection between California's wildfires and climate change, something no major insurance company had done before. It warned that with wildfire activity up 400 400% 400 since 1970 and disasters including the campfire, Causing $24 billion in losses, insurance rates might become unaffordable to many people. At some point, insurers could withdraw completely from danger zones. This is just a hypothetical, but let's just say uh, they say we're no longer going to insure properties in Napa Valley. We're too worried about wildfires, Steele said. Suddenly, you're going to have a lot of difficulty writing new mortgages in, in that entire area, and that's going to dramatically reduce the value of exist, existing loans that you're making and the property values in that area. If this, hap if this happened in enough major housing markets, it could wipe out the value of millions of people's homes and potentially bankrupt local and state governments that rely on property taxes. That would also make assets on the balance sheets of the banks suddenly crater, Steele said. One or two of these financial institutions collapsing could in turn instigate a cascading financial crisis similar in scope and scale to the hum uh, hurricane scenario above. Three. Massive declines in oil demand make investors panic. Uh-oh, what if the Green New Deal actually gets implemented? In November, the International Energy Agency predicted that humankind's thirst for oil could plateau within a decade. This puts the typically conservative agency in line with analysts from companies like Bank of America and Fitch Ratings, who have also predicted a peak by 2030 due to the adoption of electric vehicles and other fossil fuel replacing technologies. If something were to suddenly speed up the plateau's arrival, like the election of Democratic president, a Democratic president and Congress in 2020 that immediately began moving forward with economy transforming Green New Deal and economy transforming Green New Deal, it could make many oil and gas reserves worthless and cause investors to flee from companies that own them. Ooh, another more fallout from the Green New Deal. Um, but that's that's why a Green New Deal um, really has to be implemented as kind of like an overall economic overhaul. Um, you can't just start implementing these things, you know, kind of piecemeal. And as with Bernie Sanders saying that we should... Um, privatize or not privatize but um take under public ownership the fossil fuel industry or the energy um industry or the power industry um what would really be a way to go would be to um nationalize uh a multitude of industries all at once um and also make sure that people have uh food and housing and clothing and shelter. Um, I think housing and shelter are the same thing. Uh, it could make many oil and gas reserves worthless and cause investors to flee from companies that own them. A price shock could ripple across the financial system as firms and investors offload assets at fire sale prices, the paper reads. It's hard to see things like the U.S. shale oil industry or the Canadian tar sands surviving the so-called carbon bubble being burst. And while in one sense that would be great for fighting climate change, an abrupt fossil fuel sector crash could be terrible for many workers, which is why groups like the Climate Justice Alliance 
are pushing to ensure that a just transition, quote unquote, easing the impacts for affected communities is central to the Green New Deal. When bubbles burst, it's usually the folks on the bottom that get hurt, Steele said. Central to a Green New Deal would be making every, making sure everybody has food, health care, housing. Um, I would include the ability, you know, giving people the ability to grow their own food, helping people with uh, independence, off-grid independence, um, sustainability, etc. Four, the housing market goes literally and figuratively underwater. Despite more than 311,000 homes being at risk of chronic flooding in the next 30 years, lenders are still giving people mortgages in vulnerable areas. Up to $100 billion of coastal mortgages are issued every year if sea levels rise by six feet by 2100. As has been es- estimated, about $900 billion worth of U.S. homes homes would l- be literally and in turn financially underwater, the paper reads. This includes more than half of the housing stock for almost 300 cities. But a financial, cr- financial crash could come well before that, as big short investor David Burt explained to Vice this October could be triggered by triggered by a climate disaster that causes a wave of foreclosures in the city. This is what nearly happened to Houston in 2017 after Hurricane Harvey. Or, like the fossil fuel scenario above, it might begin with an exodus of investors from a housing market once they appreciate the de- dangers they're exposed to. It could be just a mass realization that all of this property is severely compromised. Alice Hill, a former Obama advisor who now works on climate change at the Roosevelt Institute, has warned. For Steele, the takeaway is obvious. Wall Street needs to stop investing in the fossil fuel companies driving climate change and making these scenarios more likely to occur. You need government intervention, he said. You need financial regulators to come in and say you can't keep financing fossil fuels. This is only creating risk for you and society because Wall Street will keep doing dangerous things until someone makes them stop. Uh, Okay, so it's not regulators that are going to help this out. Um. Sorry to say, <laughs> it's going to be a massive transformation of the entire financial uh, system uh, because it's going to crash. It's going to crash one way or the other. Uh, crashes if you don't do anything about it. It crashes if you do it intentionally. Uh, why not do it intentionally and that way you know, manage the, the fallout somewhat? Lastly, let's look at more COP25 news. Polluting companies are sponsoring COP25 talks in exchange for tax breaks. All right. Go COP25. Handle that climate change business, boys. December 12th, 2019. Big polluters are to blame for slow progress in the annual UN climate negotiations in Madrid, Spain, according to activists, with several companies sponsoring the talks in exchange for tax breaks. Sponsors of the talks, known as COP25, include the electric, electrical utilities company Iberdrola, which produced 24.6 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions in 2018, and Endesa, which through its operations produced 61.9 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, according to analysis. No, uh, nonetheless, representatives from major oil and gas companies have been invited to speak on panels taking place throughout the meeting. Everything in this hall smells bad. It smells of coal, it smells of oil, it smells of gas. This is because we have in these spaces the same transnational corporations that are polluting the world and leading us to extinction, and they are pushing their agendas, says Natalie uh, Rangifo, Al- Rangifo Alvarez of NGO Corporate Accountability, one of the groups that produced the analysis of the corporate sponsors of the conference. To attend the climate conference, delegates must be accredited by the UN's climate organization known as UNFCCC. But some activists have argued that instead of being approved and invited to uh, into the negotiations, pol- uh, polluting corporations should be barred from the proceedings. Oh, what a thought. That kind of makes sense. It might be logical, even, given their financial interests in the continuing extraction of fossil fuels. Inside the talks, trade associations... Representing the interests of the fossil fuel industry and other big polluters stock the halls and push their members' agenda. Stock the halls with barrels of oil. The results of this corporate omnipresence is clear. The negotiations move at a snail's pace and more often than not reflect the interests of global corporations, not people and the planet, wrote campaigners against corporate influence on the website Common Dreams as the negotiations kicked off last week. 
polluting panels. On Tuesday, a Shell representative took part in a panel organized by the International Emissions Trading Associations, known known as the IETA, a pro-carbon market business lobby whose members include BP, Chevron, Shell, and TransCanada. David Hone, Shell's chief climate change advisor, it's an awesome job, right? I'm climate change advisor for Shell, took to the stage to advocate for carbon pricing and car- carbon capture and storage. Okay. Carbon pricing being the most ineffective and ridiculous idea for fighting climate change ever, because whatever. Uh, Pasco Sabado, I don't even know why scientists keep on going, carbon, we have to have some carbon pricing. You guys are dinosaurs. Pasco Sabado, Sabido of campaign group Corporate Europe Observatory called Hone's appearance a huge conflict of interest. C- CEO is concerned... That's Corporate Europe Observatory, otherwise known as CEO. It's concerned the industry <clears throat> is using the promise of carbon capture and storage technology as an excuse to avoid directly reducing emissions by promising to bury them instead of transi- transitioning away from fossil fuels altogether. Shell is a multi-billion pound corporation and has a responsibility to its shareholders and it needs to keep showing it has reserves on its books and that it keeps turning a profit, Sabido said. Nor was the Shell panel a one-off event, according to Sabido. Shell has spoken at six events during this year's conference and sent 146 delegates to the UN climate talks over the past 20 years. Okay. Now we can see that these things are uh, not all they're cracked up to be. On Monday, the government of Australia hosted a joint reception alongside the Carbon Market Institute, whose members include BP, Shell, Conoco. The invitation-only event illustrates to the extent to which energy companies have access to national governments in the UN policymaking process. This access quickly turns into influence. At the negotiations last year, Hone boasted that Shell had helped to write some of the text that appears in the Paris Agreement, including controversial language around carbon markets. Ignoring communities as well as offering access to the negotiations, activists argue that corporate sponsorship gives polluting companies an opportunity to unfairly clean up their images. Indeed, for many activists, particularly in the global south, ending fossil fuel extraction is not only about fighting climate change, but also about supporting human rights. Here's an idea for COP26. Maybe bar all fossil fuel companies. Maybe that should be a thing. Maybe activists, protesters should get out there months before this goes on and and insist that there are no uh, fossil fuel representatives at these conferences. Indeed, for many activists, particularly in Global South, ending fossil fuel extraction is not only about fighting climate change, but also about supporting human rights. Shell, for instance, has been accused of human rights abuses and environmental destruction in Nigeria. Time and again, corporations ignore communities and the lands that they feed from. They extract resources and use their profits to oil their way into negotiations like COP or COP and use their greenwashing to try and position themselves as acceptable. Um... Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, until these companies are are barred from these negotiations, or you know, not made part of the process, these will continue to be continue to be a joke, um, or just so weak as to make them you know ineffectual and useless. So. Uh, what is the point exactly? Uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace.